Nuns and sisters, is there a difference? Why are all nuns and sisters brides of Christ? Why do women choose to go into a nunnery? Were they all like my first grade teacher, Sister Hitzelot? And what about the flying nun? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the difference between nuns and sisters, why medieval women chose to go into a convent, the most unusual order, the Bridgetines, tertiaries, anchoresses, and mystics, and how to begin the Beguines. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. Well, women could never become priests, they could still live as spiritual warriors, as either nuns, who took vows of poverty and obedience, lived an enclosed life, and prayed the liturgical hours much like monks, or sisters, who only took vows of obedience, could own property, could leave the convent or the nunnery, and minister to the public much like a priest, other than that whole mass and sacrament thing. Conversi and tertiaries also existed. Through entering a nunnery, women could preserve both mind and body, living a life of high status and regard, largely free of male control, and actually getting male respect for what they say and what they do. Of course, considering that the nuns and the sisters held large tracts of land, and they had to attend Mass daily, take communion, and confession. They did unfortunately require the use of male estate stewards and priests. But at least no man was allowed to go into the convent or the nunnery. Most nuns and sisters who were and are considered brides of Christ, which has always made me wonder, does that mean Jesus is a polygamist? Anyway, why be a bride of Christ? Well, the idea is this is a way to protect them from men who seek to force them into marriage. Essentially, they're already married. Anyway, in medieval times, most of the nuns were Benedictines, Cistercians, or Carthusians. But most monkish orders included provisions for including both nuns and sisters. Nuns and sisters both wore the same outfits as their male counterparts. Though nuns and sisters had to wear the white wimple encircling their faces to hide their hair. You see this? This is, of course, the thing that the uh, nuns are most famous for, the headdress. And the idea is, in the Old Testament, one of the provisions says that a married woman shall not show her hair to any but her own husband. And of course, since nuns are married to Jesus, no earthly man is allowed to see their hair. Also, it's a practical measure. Apparently, many medieval men were so turned on by a woman's hair. This way, you avoid the men forcing them to become tempted. Oh, your greasy matted hair so turns me on, baby. Anyway, that was the reason. They, of course, also wore a long veil. Many orders also would wear a rosary on their belts or a cross around their necks. 
Carmelite nuns lived an enclosed life in a nunnery and hence rarely left it. Though they could and can to this day have visitors as long as a grill separates them. And like their male counterparts, they aimed at self-sufficiency, running their own gardens, farms, workshops, and a chapel on the convent grounds. Whereas in this one you see here, this is your typical uh, dinner, breakfast meal. The nuns eat while one of their number reads a selection from the scriptures to them. Austin canonesses lived a similar lifestyle to their male counterparts, the Austin canons. Except, of course, that they could not engage in priestly ministry, meet with the public, help to maintain cathedrals, or sing the daily services. And, wow, she looks like she's going to be a barrel of laughs. In fact, she kind of reminds me of my first grade teacher, Sister Hits A Lot. The Bridgetines were founded by St. Bridget of Sweden, and here are two depictions of her, in 1344. They followed the rule of St. Augustine and originally were a double order, open to both sexes. So there'd be a convent of no more than 60 nuns and maybe four lay sisters, governed by an abbess. And on the opposite side of the convent wall, would be a monastery, an abbey, of no more than 13 monks and four deacons or priests to serve as chaplains and eight lay brothers. But all would be under the control of the mother superior, the abbess. The nuns were strictly enclosed, dedicated to study and scholarship. So yes, they had to know how to both read and write, and they would all wear a metal crown of the five holy wounds, which you can kind of see in this thing here, this metal device over their head. In fact, you can see it better with uh, St. Bridget here. There's a metal device, and at this part, at the top, and either side, in the back, so one, two, three, four, and five, there was a red stone. So the red stone symbolic of each of Christ's five wounds. Meanwhile, the monks, that would be here, so this is your Bridgetine convent, these are the nuns, this is the Mother Superior, in fact, would, in this case, would be Sister, uh, excuse me, St. Bridget, and over here, of course, would be the various monks. Anyway, the monks were to go out to preach and evangelize, and they would wear a red cross with a Eucharist at the center on their right breast. Another group is the Poor Clares. These were founded when Clare, daughter of an upper-class Assisi family, heard St. Frankie, St. Frankie of Assisi preach, left home to join his community, and was eventually accepted by him as a nun in 1212. 1216, she became abbess of San Damiano Convent, where she was joined by her mother, two sisters, and other women of Tuscany. Eventually, of course, she will become St. Clair. The poor Clare strictly follow the rule of St. Francis, especially that of extreme poverty, begging for their food, with their convents held in trust by the papacy so that they might not own any property. The order quickly spread through Europe. The first convent of Dominican nuns was established by St. Dominic in 1206, eight years before he actually founded his own Dominican order. But unlike his friars, they were to live a cloistered life of prayer and contemplation. And so by 1300, Dominican convents had spread across Europe, including several founded as retreats from the world for upper-class women. Dominican nuns lived communally like monks, though much stricter, praying and chanting the divine services, with Dominican friars serving as their priests and confessors, all governed by the Dominican provincial general.
Besides nuns and sisters, another aspect of religious life open to women would have been as an anchoress, though many of the anchoresses were also nuns or sisters. Or perhaps we can call them solitaries, as they lived a solitary life of extreme austerity and prayer in a small cell attached to the side of a church. Example, here is one right here, for example. This would have been built on, and inside, the cell is only 12 feet by 15 feet square. Walled in with only a small window or squint to partake in Mass and Communion. So this is various ones. Here is the squint. This one is uh, situated so it only looks towards the altar. This is a bit of a slightly bigger one, a trefoil, which could only be opened from the outside as a way to pass food inside. This one, again, a little squint here. And another area simply to pass food in. The outside squints, these little trefoil, as you see perhaps here or here or here. This way they could dispense spiritual wisdom and advice to any who sought it. And anchoresses got even more respect from men than the typical nun or sister, which already was tremendously higher than any the man gave to a regular woman in medieval times. Oftentimes, these little anchoresses, the anchorage hold, you might say, had a small hatch. The names for servants to provide the minimum of food and water provided to the anchoress, collect and dispose of her bodily waste, and perhaps care for her in illness, and then eventually to take her body out when she's dead. Anchorites had to take a solemn vow to God not to leave their cell upon death, we usually sealed in under the supervision of the local bishop. So this is a, a famous one. This is the uh, anchorist, the cell of St. Julian of Norwich, which I saw. Uh, this had to be rebuilt later because various problems in the English Civil War had been destroyed. But in this case, here it is, the bishop sealing in the anchorist. And here's this very special kind of uh, cell for an anchorist totally divorced from any other buildings, simply on your own with the one squint here and another one there. Now, if perchance an anchoress did leave the cell, perhaps through that aforementioned servant's hatch, they were subject to the hue and cry. In other words, the entire community would be alerted and they were all required to go out and track her down and bring her back. They would then be returned by force and condemned very solemnly condemned to hell by the bishop and then reinserted into the cell and all the little uh, the little hatch taken away. Most, by the way, of the anchoresses never left. Even if the church had been plundered or looted by pirates, warriors, a war, or burned, if the church itself had been burned they usually burned with the church. Many of the nuns, sisters, and anchoresses were also mystics, especially engaged in what I call spiritual aerobics, where they might repeatedly bash their head against the wall, fall flat on the floor with no effort to break their fall, painfully arching their backs or rotating their arms or legs or hands or feet, in ways no body was designed to ever do, whipping themselves bloody, depriving themselves of sleep for days, if not weeks on end, eating small vegan meals or none at all for weeks, even months at a stretch, and practicing other forms of self-mortification. Many female mystics began having visions during some crisis in their lives, such as a difficult childbirth, or the months following such, a bad, abusive marriage, or betrothal to a bad, abusive man, or perhaps a difficult or troublesome puberty. And they were often beset by visions of tormenting demons and devils, as you see here, demons and devils, during which Jesus would appear, 
perhaps like this or like this, in which Jesus would appear and chase the demons and devils away and tell the mystic all would be well. All shall be well. Most simply experience visions and practice the usual self-mortification of mystics. But some, most later canonized, by the way, or perhaps are still on the road to do so, also experience religious ecstasy, sometimes more than once. Hard to describe what religious ecstasy is. Think of it as spiritual orgasm. They might also engage in what today might charitably called eccentric or bizarre behavior, and what others might call crazy or just plain wacko behavior, even back then, such as Marjorie Kemp, who had daily, hours-long crying jags, whenever she thought of the passion, the suffering, the crucifixion of Jesus, she would get kicked out of churches, no crying rooms back then. Her husband eventually left her. She cried her way to Jerusalem and back. Uh, Margareta Ebner, very similar to Marjorie Kemp, except instead of crying, she would have daily, hours-long bouts of laughter. Maria de Santo Domingo, whose body would go completely rigid for long hours. You could not move it even if you tried. Lidvina of Shaddam, whose skin, bones, and intestines fell off or out of her body, but yet she lived for years. Lutgard of Awares, who also is said to levitate and drip blood from her forehead. This is supposed to be Lutgard of Awares in her first vision when she's knocked down on the ice. Marie of Oines, who ate naught but rock-hard bread. Yes, it broke all her teeth. She didn't care. And then one of the most unusual ones, so this is, of course, uh, Lutgard of Awares. This would have been um, Marie of Oines. Oh, and this is the most unusual one, Agnes, uh, Agnes Blonbecken, who daily suffered from hours-long erotic visions including one where she claimed to have tasted Jesus's foreskin in her mouth and down her throat and swallowed his, quote-unquote, sweet divine milk. And now, let's begin the begins. Da -da -da -da, music and laughter. Da -da 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 -da. Let us begin the begins. Anyway, the Beguines were founded by single and widowed women living on the edge of low country towns in the early 12th century, living together in communities called Beguinages, devoting themselves to prayer and good works among the poor, a female counterpart to the Begards. As they did not take vows, they were not nuns, nor were they sisters and hence could return to the world and wed if they chose, though few did so. They had no mother house, no rule, but lived together, rich and poor, upper class and lower class, as few as ten to as many as thousands. Beguine spread rapidly across the British Isles and Northern Europe, heavily influencing popular worship amongst the urban population. During the 13th century, many became mystics and beggars, though some were executed as heretics by worried church authorities, such as Marguerite of Perete. Here's today's wrap-up quote. Quote, there was also a nun, a prioress, who, in her smiling, modest was and coy. Her greatest oath was, but by Saint Eloy, and she was known as Madame Eglantine. Full well she sang the services divine, intoning through her nose, becomingly. She was so charitable and piteous that she would weep if she but saw a mouse caught in a trap, though it were dead or bled. 
Right decorous her pleated wimple was, her nose was fine, her eyes were blue as glass, her mouth was small and there was soft and red, but certainly she had a fair forehead, it was almost a full span broad I own. Chaucer in 1380. Let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video, and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, and subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos, and click on that little bell thingy, so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the past.